Welcome to Authentic Living with Roxanne, a place where we have conscious conversations about things that really matter in our lives. And now, here's your host, Roxanne Derhage. Our interview last week was so good that we decided to turn it into a two-part series. If you missed last week, you'll find the link in the show notes. It's not mandatory that you listen, but we want to make sure that you don't miss out on this amazing conversation. Hi, everyone. It's uh, Roxanne Durhodge. Um, Today, I have the honor of moderating a panel panel on leadership. And it's a space that um, I spend a lot of time and I've been fortunate to um, be in the same room with uh, many of these amazing women that I sit with today. Uh, And today we're gonna discuss uh, some of the things that we know about resilience and conflict in leadership and some of the best practices based on the different environments that my my colleagues here uh, work in. So I'm going to introduce them as best as possible, um, and we're going to include their bios, which is phenomenal, which will give you a tip of what they do. So uh, Barb Veda, um, Barb has been in the behavioral management um, business for about uh, over 30 years. Um, Barb has done a lot of research and presented internationally at conferences on best practices around uh, cancer Uh, education and uh, leadership. So Barb, welcome uh, to our panel today. Uh, There's uh, Linda Crockett and Linda is, um, she was one of the founders of the full service workplace bullying um, and harassment services in Canada, one of the first. And so um, Linda, thanks so much for being here today. And Linda's going to share with us kind of her perspective. And she also has a fascinating event coming up uh, that we want to chat a little bit more about. Um, next, I have Trina uh, Reikoff, and uh, Trina is also um, a resilience uh, specialist. Uh, Trina is based out of uh, Toronto, and she's the owner of TLR uh, Solutions Conflict Inc. And our international um, presence today is uh, June. Joni Petty, and she's in South Africa, and she is an international resilience specialist and also a keynote speaker. So everyone, uh, welcome, um, and so glad to see your lovely faces today. That's amazing, right? Because, you know, the average person and all of us here, we understand all the lingo, right? Mm-hmm. And, and I think of when I worked with Barb, and I managed a portfolio of 50 companies at any given point, I would say about 65% of my portfolio was in flux. So think of the context Mm -hmm. of not knowing some of the basics that we're talking about and now bring it forward to 2023 where flux is a a macro kind of umbrella to everything that people are experiencing within companies. And then try to not be trauma-informed about what people experienced through COVID, what people are going through with um, right sizing, downsizing, um, and, you know, selling off of certain parts of companies, um, mergers, acquisitions. That's a whole lot of uh, moving parts all at once. And within the context of that, we're wondering, you know, what are people needing? And if you're not aware as a management team or a supervisor or a middle manager um, of all those elements, not that to, to someone's point, you don't have to be. Um, a trauma therapist or a psychologist in any way, but you have to know the fundamental basics of what are the symptoms potentially that might display itself when someone's sitting across from you. And then know enough to say they're needing a bit more. They need to be able to be sent somewhere else. And I think that's the education piece that I think is is, is needed out there. I think though for the education piece, what I find to be absolutely ironic is that we're talking about psychological safety psychological it's in the title it's right there psychological hazards psychological harassment psychological violence psychological injuries it's right there if you've got a psychological component you need to have the trauma-informed piece as well absolutely and i think too it's the importance of 
the leaders of everybody, it's being vulnerable because you got to be able to recognize your own trauma response because we've all experienced something. So to be able to start becoming trauma-informed by a reflection of your own past history, your own experiences of trauma, whether personal, professional, or environmental, an earthquake, you know, capsizing on the water. Environmentally, there's many. So it's becoming trauma-informed is even recognizing what might you might experience so that if you're triggered or you might have a flashback while you're having an interview or giving a meeting and you're not sure why. You know, I think we have to bring this back to leadership if we can about being the leader themselves being trauma informed is a part of that is having that emotional intelligence about when you're being triggered as a leader. You know, I might be a leader who's avoiding conflict because I have a past history of being a child of a domestic violence, right? And I'm, mm -hmm. I'm now avoiding conflict, which means I'm not being a really effective leader because I'm avoiding conflict within my staff. So part of being psycho, you know, trauma informed is that emotional intelligence, having self insight to your own triggers, your own limitations, your strengths, of course but also to having trust in your own judgment, being aware, knowing that you need to go deal with your fear of conflict, all of that's involved. So that emotional empathy piece is involved in trauma-informed. And as leaders, um, Linda, I was going to say the same thing, is that that, that emotional intelligence piece, I mean, I uh, look at research from 150 countries. I mean, that's a lot of big bank research uh, 100,000 people at a time, is that, you know, this whole emotional intelligence piece, we know that the research is showing that leaders who have good EQ are perform, you know, twice as, as well as leaders who don't. So if you're trauma-informed, I love the examples that both you um, and Trina have given. So, you know, if you come from, you know, a household when there was abuse, um, and there's bullying in the workplace, is how do you actually language that? So your emotional literacy, how do you navigate those emotions? So it's having all of those capabilities, and those are measurable skills. Those are teachable skills. So we are finding worldwide that where organizations are prioritizing EQ upskilling and training, they are 22 times more high performing. So it's really, you know, that's the heart of it is, you know, I always look at resilience with four dimensions and we can go, you know, risk management and change management programs, but I go, you know, emotions drive people and people drive performance. So you've got to go back to the person and the person that's four legs to the table. What is their mental resilience like? What's their emotional resilience like? What's their physical resilience like? And what's their sense of purpose? And when you start dealing with people as individuals, giving them those EQ skills, teaching them that self-awareness, giving them, you know, to what uh, Bob was saying earlier, those things around as individuals, how do we trust each other you know trust worldwide has gone down dramatically so we've really got to go back to i think we've got to go back to basics post covid and leaders need to be given some of these the, the toolkit to handle you know what we used to call the soft skills so yes. joni and team here's my question and this is i love what you said and here's the challenge if you look at uh the corporate structure the executive structure I believe it's still often dominated by men and there isn't as much diversity as we wish. I think that tide is changing. What we know about, and I'll be the counselor again, I'll put my counselor hat on, I'm a leader as well, but as a counselor, women are more likely to get the training and go for help. Men do, but it's it's not they're not represented as equally. So now you take that into the boardroom. How do you get the executive culture to value these softer skills? This is the scary word of trauma, counseling, psychological, all these words can be very triggering. How do you yep. put them into yeah. a context that they show the value of that social importance for your leadership uh, skills, but also for your organizational performance? As yeah. we become more aware as investors, are holding organizations more and more accountable to the social aspects of their organization, these skills are going to come higher and higher into the priority list. Mm -hmm. So shifting that yeah, traditional male set of skills that we've all experienced as leaders, not to mm -hmm. be sexist here, but I am being a little, 
generic and, and generalizing. How do we shift that into these other types of conversations and soften? It's simple. And it's simple. Okay, it's good. Simple. Joni, solve it. Give it to us. <laughs> Trina mentioned it earlier, workplace assessments. So it's like I work mainly at senior management and director level. And you're right, unfortunately, Bob, is that 80% of the teams that I work with are men. So I don't ever, and you, you know, you would say data, I would say data, um, is that workplace assessments, you've got to go in with data. So I did a Chicago team, actually, all men on Tuesday night. And it was interesting. I made them do a workplace assessment. I said, here is a worldwide validated assessment. And it's validated and it's reliable. I teach at business schools. It looks at the five drivers of, of high performance in your exec team. Are your people motivated? Are they, um, what are they, the ability to, um, and agility to handle change? What is the teamwork cohesion like? What's the execution like? And then the fifth driver is trust. And let me tell you, there, there were three pulse points per each of those five drivers. So 15 pulse points. And that was scoped against uh, 50,000 teams worldwide. So looking at where they were at, they were shocking these men. And trust was at a low. So mm -hmm. you can't open those conversations unless you've got data. I think that's yeah. a simple way to crack the code. And Can I just data, ask you a question, you Joni? How do you get them to accept an, uh, an assessment? I mean, I agree, assessment and data is critical, but how do you even get in the door if you've got resistance? The old boys club, the old girl club is saying, no, I don't want, you know, I don't want to know. They have all kinds of reasons. How do you get past that? I, I can um, share that in, in Canada. Coaching. coaching. Huh? When you're coaching the CEO, and I've been coaching the CEO for a year now, and um he has a hybrid team in Chicago, Spain, Amsterdam, and Cape Town. So his exec team are all over, these guys. And I said to him, I can tell you right now, from what I've heard around the world, you don't have a cohesive team. And you, if I was you, you got to, you know, as good old Jim Collins said also 20 years ago, you know, good leaders need to look in the mirror to see what's happening. So let's put the mirror up. Let's have an assessment and let's, you know, see what's but what happening. what do they say? I don't want to know. I mean, that's that's the, unfortunately, then they take something critical. Oftentimes, unless exactly. you're in the front door with the CEO for them yep. to start to listen. Or in but Canada. Like, yeah, we take we Canada, situation, yeah. We've we've had critical situations, time. right? Unfortunately, yes. then that opens the door. Or yeah. um, business cases too, right? Like competitive edge, uh, potentially. But Linda, you're right. How yeah. is it, we, you know, if you are, if you're, if you're preaching to the aware Right now, I've lost someone. I've lost someone. There's been a critical accident. Um, I'm losing market share. So what's what's the value of a case? That's different. But if you're trying to, if you're talking about the unaware uh, portion of sectors, uh, that's something. I mean, uh, maybe Trina can share. She was going to share something. Yeah. Those are the people that are harder to get to. But maybe maybe you do have an inroads at some point in a different way. With, with the assessments that I do, there is a cost to conflict. So when you want to get to that C-suite or the, the male who's not as sometimes, you know, resistant, it's, it comes down to time, money, and reputation. And there actually is a formula to calculate the cost of conflict. And when you have the metrics and you have the stats of the disability, the retention, the presenteeism, it all comes down. And that's part of having a workplace assessment. And now in Canada, like I was just actually sharing this earlier on this morning, in Ontario, workplace assessments are now part of occupational health and safety labor code law across Canada. Each province is different, right? The federal government has Bill 168, but in, in Ontario, it is um, under occupational health and safety doing workplace assessments, it's mandatory, it's part of the labor code. And there is a fine attached to it if you are not starting to implement these workplace assessments to mitigate risk and identify psychosocial hazards. So when we look at like out of the Canadian Occupational Health and Safety, workload. Workload is now identified in Canada as a psychosocial hazard. So just like you would identify ice as a hazard, the risk is slip and fall. How are you gonna mitigate it? Because slip and fall could be a bruise. Slip and fall could be death. 
Well, workload is exactly like ICE. It is a psychosocial factor that now by labor code standards and occupational health and safety has to be mitigated. That and it's through education. Right it sounds right? fantastic. I can see but in all the other provinces that I work in that a lot of employers are trying to stay under the radar from that, trying to avoid that. And that's why, you know, I'm overloaded with cases and we have such, well, we've had research out for de decades about the costs of not doing the right thing. We've had suicides, you know, on social media due to bullying in the workplace. And that's not, that's still not making people say, please do an assessment. I want to prevent this from happening at my work. I want to make sure this environment is healthy. That's not what's happening for in my world of where I see people who are, I have employers call me and say, you know, we've done an investigation, this, you know, man or woman or whoever has been substantiated as being a bully or a harasser, and we want to keep them. They're very skilled, but we need them to come and see you because they have to change these behaviors. And if they don't show up, they're terminated. So that's the kind of people that I'll work yeah. with are the bullies themselves. And then I'll, when I've done my assessment and I've come up with my recommendations, let's get an assessment on your cult workplace culture. Let's get your staff trained, trauma-informed. Let's get your, your leadership team cohesive on zero tolerance. It's a no. Yeah. So I'm going to jump in here because this is like, I love this conversation. So you have the continuum and I'll put Joni, your customers, progressive, open and willing to take the risk. They're the ideal. Linda, you see the back end of clients that aren't willing to take, to, you know, you see the worst. You see the toxic cultures, the leaders that aren't informed, the, 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 the HR, I'm going to pick on HR, the HR that greets you with a bat. A verbal bat that says, oh, this isn't as much, you know, this is really isn't a problem. Let's mediate. Let's not deal with it. Let's bury it, as, you know, maybe Roxanne would say, you know, legislation is telling us, as Trina knows, you got to do this. But the truth is, you can only work with those cultures that are willing to be open. And you asked at the beginning, what makes a good leader? How do we build resilience? It's it's vulnerability it's risk. If you start to obsess, at least you have a starting point, Joni, to start to determine strategy. This is the place we're starting. And tomorrow we're going to be somewhere different because we're making a commitment. We're making a, because once you do that, you're vulnerable. And that also, to me, is a very important leadership skill. Mm -hmm. But not all cultures are there. Yeah. So, yep. Mindy, you see the worst. Joni, you've described the most progressive. And I think this, you know, how do you, and I, I, I'll end by saying, I think Roxanne, your point is, don't ever waste a good crisis. Because yeah. it's the crisis, the stock is half the price, half the value. Your, your talent is leaving. Your customers know the truth. If you don't look, I can't remember who said it, you got to look in the mirror as a leader. And I'll quote you, you got to be reflective, right, Roxanne? You got to look in that mirror and decide that you want to run a good culture. Once you make that commitment, then look at all we can do. Yeah. But you Linda, know, you get you get the back end of the worst of the worst. I, I'm I do. And well, and, 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 and you know, and with and sectors with like, sec with sectors across um, Canada, when I worked in my role, um, and I wasn't the first responder, but I was, you know, part of Barb's team who would send out the teams. And you know, some sectors are willing and open to say, wow, mm -hmm. this is a crisis. And other ones were great. Thanks for, you know, getting somebody here within a day. Thanks for the debriefing. Goodbye. Yeah. And the back end of that would be that there would be repetition. There would still be the high incidental absences. There would be, still be the high short-term disability claims and long-term claims. And they're not willing to deal with it to Linda's point. So again, I think it's it's using, unfortunately, a crisis. Not often was I working with a company that says, what is the what is the impact of a case? Like, you know, where they're willing to have those conversations when you sit across a health and wellness committee or an HR committee or a labor union committee. I would sit across from that. And then oftentimes it depended on the leader, the top, and if they were even willing to have those conversations with us. Others were like, um, you know, the legal profession said, not going to deal with it. Um, it's okay. So it depends on the sector. And I think, um, yes, to Barb's point, sometimes at crises, 
I would hope that we're no longer just crises based on, but unfortunately, that's still where we are. But Roxanne, it's authentic action. It's it's what I refer to. Like governance is great, policy manuals are great, but the truth is in the action. And leaders will just, you know, an authentic leader will take we'll hopefully see what's going on, but they'll take that crisis and they'll turn it into action. It's it's whether they're really taking meaningful action. And the organization, the people know, your, your, each organization, the employees know whether there is really, if they're cynical, it's because it's been built over time. Cynicism just doesn't happen in one day. No, absolutely. So let's, let's, let's kind of, look at a frame, right? You all have different, obviously, Joni's bringing the international, Linda, you're look, working across Canada in lot, in more on the harassment, bullying. Trina's doing a bit of combination or uh, the same and myself in different arenas. But if you can say, right, for, for leadership teams that are thinking, I know we have issues, but my sector doesn't support it, right? Like we don't, we know we have issues in manufacturing, or we know we have issues in professional services, what might be some of the ways to potentially start to open the possibility of people listening with a different ear? I'd like to go first and share. I'd like to come from the lens of um, become conflict curious, not conflict avoidant. I always use creating just the SRSR, self-reflection strengthens resiliency. And when we look at the workplace assessment and a leadership legacy, think of it as moving forward after COVID and an engineer and an architect in your building, that skyscraper. You need a solid foundation, mm -hmm. right? If you're in Cayman or where there's earthquakes or tornadoes, you need to have that solid foundation to mitigate future risks. That's the opportunity right now to engage and be curious and have a workplace assessment because those pain points and gaps and the resilient strengths of having everybody participate voluntarily and confidentially, you're gonna get the resilient solutions from the people that work there at every level. So think of it right now as we are all just building that stable foundation to create intergenerational conflict and trauma resiliency and mitigate risk. Anybody else want to add to something along those lines? Or did uh, Trina capture it? Most of fundamentally, it's a foundation, you're right. Um, and sometimes you're gonna to have to be brave as a leader to be the first uh, based well, on your industry as well. I we agree. All, I'm sure that we all agree that leadership sets the tone of a work environment, right? Yep. We mm -hmm. all agree with that. Yes. And, and we see that there is massive change happening in the world of, as far as awareness and knowledge about psychological safety that's you know it's on the tip of everybody's tongue now 12 years ago when I started my company nobody was talking about this but today everybody's talking about it and money hasn't talked death hasn't talked exposure starting to talk exposure of large firms um, them getting recognition for being toxic um, exposure of politicians exposure of leaders and the costs involved, that's getting movement now. That's that's starting to build awareness and people are starting to knock on my door that never used to speak to me, that used to push me away and make fun of the work I do, are now knocking on my door. And I'm talking large, large organizations that I can't name that are stomach coming forward. So I do see change, I do see hope. And I see, I see that that's starting to get the motivation. The crises uh, is the exposure. <laughs> You know, one last thing I want to say about research shows between 70 to 75 percent, depending on which research you're looking at, uh, bullying, harassment, this toxicity is coming top down. You know, that that might that has scared people that has angered people that I'm training. But that's actually great news for us to know, because what it tells us is that we have not been setting leaders up for success. We've been putting in people in positions of leadership that are not equipped to do the job. We're putting people in leadership roles because nobody else wants the job. We're putting people in positions of leadership because we owe our friend a favor or our sister or our cousin, and they're not equipped. They're not ready for that level of responsibility. So the solution is start hiring for merit, start you know training, start mentoring, offer them coaching, 
uh, monitor them and set them up for success because if we could correct that 70%, we're going to correct the remaining percent. You know, even bullying or harassment, toxicity coming bottom up, that's a leadership problem. Mm -hmm. So let's set them up for success. I would say very much what you're saying, uh, Linda. And it's what's also the tide is changing, where leaders are now far more open to executive coaching. And, uh, you know, you, I'm saying it in different words, you said it, but the fish rots from the head down. So if you can get those uh, senior people coached, it is, you know, that that domino effect is magnificent. And as much as psychological safety and, and trust is now such, you know, the buzzwords, um, even if people don't understand them, is if they're open to being coached, we're going to start to see behavior shifts. You know, as humans, we overcomplicate things, actually. There are only three things we can do. We think, we feel, and we choose to take action or not. So when we teach people how to use their emotional intelligence, how to change state if they need to, and to, you know, be intentional about their words and take different actions, you know, we become more self-aware. So it's, uh, we really have got to, and that's why I will never do a culture shift program at any other level, except the CEO and the director level. I'll never start anywhere else. Good. Mm -hmm. Welcome. Anyone else want to share? Uh, their perspective. I, I think we've we've um, definitely. My goodness, I knew when I put you together, I was going to get a lot. But boy, did I ever! Um, this has been truly amazing, everybody. You know, and um, I love that the fish raw from the head, from the head, to, <laughs> head down. Like I mean, how simple, but what an image that really reflects um, what's important. And you know, I. With my work, what I often say is, um, and this is a, I think of Barb, I think of um, Bloor Street when I bring up this, this analogy. And I think, um, you know, when you're leading and there's nobody, when you come up to the cooler and we're all stay, standing around talking, that the conversation should not shift for you as the leader. Yep. And that space of safety, and I, I think of Bloor Street because Barb and I used to, that was our head office, because I would see the leadership um, perspective when they enter the room oftentimes the temperature and the mode and, and perspective of the conversation shifted often so my my call out to leaders is with all these amazing perspectives what is your legacy what is mm -hmm. it that you truly want to leave behind so that you leave the environments that you enter so much better than when you entered when you're leaving people re will remember whether it's a Barb Veda or a Johnny Petey, like what is it that you want that environment to remember the most about you um, from the element of safety and trust and with those things in place, you know, all the things that are possible. So a couple of things, I just wanted everybody just to, if there's one last word you wanted to share with everyone listening and also to let everybody know you have an amazing panel here. Please reach out in whatever perspective that you think you can gain from them. Um, so, Barb, I'll start with you. If people are trying to get a hold of you, if there's anything else you want to say, just uh, share it and then let them know where to get a hold of you. Sure. I'm going to share that uh, I'm easy to find in LinkedIn. It's uh, my my biggest focus right now is I'm working on a fundraiser. I'm working with Linda under the with the organization in Canada called the Canadian uh, Institute for Workplace Bullying and Harassment, and we are doing our first fundraiser. It takes place in the week of uh, October nineteenth. Our event is on the twentieth. Linda will do this better than I am, but but we're looking for corporate sponsors and anyone who wants to participate or join us either virtually or in person. We'd be honored to have you. That's my big priority right now. Thank you. Um, maybe I'll toss it over to you, Linda, and you'll explain a bit more about what what we're working on and how to reach you. Sure. So October twentieth in Toronto, and we have lots of information on our website. And what we're trying to do is we're developing a toolkit to help injured workers navigate all these complex systems that have many gaps and many cracks. And you're already feeling injured, depressed, exhausted, you know, suffering insomnia and panic attacks. You need a very good guidance on what to do if this doesn't work or where do I go if I'm here? Where do I go if I'm injured? All of that. So we're developing this lovely navigation tool. 
And we're trying to raise funds to get that together. We're almost there, but we're also trying to raise some funds because most of the people that are injured out there exhaust their savings, trying to do the right thing, speak up for themselves, get some help. And they exhaust their savings to the point where everything they've worked all their lives for, the RSPs are gone. Some of them have lost their homes. And I'm talking nurses and teachers have lost their homes trying to fight for the right thing. So we're trying to raise funds so that we can at least help them get a legal consult where they can get some guidance, which will give them some courage and validation or even treatment if they're suffering. So the two things, health and legal, we're trying to get them that help. That's another injustice that they don't have access to that. So that's what the fundraiser is about. So if you've been through this uh, or if you haven't, but you know someone or you don't want your, your child or your mother or your wife or your daughter, grandson, uh, to go, you, you want support for them in the future, this is going to help change the future. That's one of the things that I want to say. I also, I also want to say that, you know, this change is happening in the world. Uh, psychological safety uh, in the workplace, like Trina was emphasizing with legislation all over Canada, provincially and federally, it's changing in other countries. What side of the change do you want to be on? Because you might as well choose now. It's happening. Like you just said beautifully, Roxanne, what do you want to be remembered for? What side of the change do you want to be on? Because you will be remembered for the one who resists it or joins it. And one last quick spot, those who are injured out there, if anybody ever says to you, you need to develop resiliency, reject that. You were resilient. You were strong. You were intelligent. You were educated. You were skilled. It wasn't about that. You've been injured and your resiliency is injured, and you, you need some help to regain your resiliency. It's still there. That's it. I'm Thanks. done. <laughs> Trina? Um, I would just love this opportunity to say that I'm very honored and blessed to be part of this, and with these amazing women leading legacies right now and worldwide change. Um, you can find me easiest on LinkedIn. And the takeaway I'd like to share is I was a part of, it's on my LinkedIn profile as well, a book called COVID and Grief. And it was made up of 102 conflict practitioners and therapists worldwide. It's in 12 languages and all the proceeds are going to the Ukraine. So gift one, buy one, give one to a community, put one in a hospital, church, school, family, group home. I'd appreciate that. And so with the community of the world. Amazing. Amazing. And I will make sure all these links are in uh, the show notes for everyone that wants um, to get connected to the fundraiser and also to Trina's book. Joni. So you can also find me on LinkedIn and uh, www.resilientpeople.coza. And I would like to offer that I can help any leader with a free emotional intelligence assessment and it's going to take you 10 minutes online and uh, it's a really nice way of just uh, calibrating and giving you a way to look in the mirror because it's difficult all of us developing self-awareness is you know ongoing for life we inch forward on this journey called life so if you want some help along the way you can certainly uh, get hold of me for a free assessment and or a uh, more uh, sophisticated assessment on mental, emotional, physical, and sense of purpose resilience. And that still is only like a 10 minute online, but it gives you a very good starting point for self-managing your own resilience cycle. And I too would like to reiterate that uh, what a blessing to meet these beautiful women from across the ocean and you're all doing such amazing work. So I'm truly honored to be, have been invited. Thank you, Roxanne. Well, thank you, everyone. And, um, you know, I always uh, put people together and sometimes I amaze myself that I get quite the combination that I do when I get everybody in the same room, um, having met you in all different walks of life. And my words to you is go out there, try to make a difference as a leader. You are put in that position for a reason. So use that time and that platform for better. Um, whether it's around um, recognizing that as 
a leader, you are can impact so many people. And there are leaders that are also coming up that are watching you that can learn. And for me, if you need to get a hold of me, my new book is out um, and it's available on Amazon. Uh, just, uh, just go, it's Return on Relationships. You can uh, get a copy there. Thanks again, everyone. And I hope to see you all very, very soon. Thanks for tuning in to Authentic Living with Roxanne, creating the space for positive, healthy change. Roxanne is a keynote speaker, psychotherapist, and coach. To work with Roxanne, visit roxanderhajcom slash blueprint. We'll see you next time on Authentic Living with Roxanne.